Hey YouTubers, at last I'm getting on with some readings from Sitchin's Lost Book of Anki. I want to keep my in-flight commentary to a minimum, so before I get this Sumerian Godfest party started, let me give you some quick thoughts. First, the video here is just some background filler type stuff. Daylight moon rolls into early evening moon with the occasional hummingbird. Weird clouds, of course, possibly a rod or orb whipping past here or there. But feel free to tune out either the video or the audio and just enjoy whichever part you want to. Or just turn the whole thing off and go do something productive. Change your oil, brush your dog, pedicure is always in order. Second, uh, I just want to quickly note the reasons behind why I find these translations so incredible. The uh, reasons are multiple. The peculiar and uh, detailed knowledge which the Sumerians seem to have about our solar system and the cosmos, some 5,000, possibly as many as 5,500 plus years ago, is pretty spectacular. The age of the text, the detail of the stories, the similarity of these stories to the more well-known tales contained in other religious texts, these are just a few noteworthy blips. To go deeper, I find that the character of Anki, not to say characters, though Anki is a fictitious personage in a play or novel, but the moral, ethical, behavioral, and psychological character of the Anunnaki god known as Anki to me. He truly does seem like a god whose personality does seem to resemble humanity. His methods of rationalizing what he wants and why he wants it, his inability to refrain from thinking with his little Anki, and the underlying good heart which seems to, he seems to possess despite some of his more historical blunders. These things make him seem kind of human. I can believe that we were actually the result of several of his bunglings combined. My readings of these texts do not cause me to see Enki as evil or like someone who would lead the Illuminati against humanity. If you listen to this reading or to some of the other readings you can find here on YouTube, you'll see that time and time again it was Enki who saved us. He protected us. He wanted to include us in his family and even put himself and his family at risk to make sure that we survived. We were, after all, his children. Enlil? Well, he's another matter. As much as Enki loved humanity, Enlil despised us. Enlil is not our pal. See what you think and keep in mind when these texts were written, almost 3,000 years before the Bible, and yet you may recognize a few things. So without further delay, let us continue with our reading of The Lost Book of Enki by Zechariah Sitchin. Now this is the account of how the olden times began, and of the era that in the annals of the golden era by name was known, and how from Nibiru to earth the missions went the gold to obtain. The escape of Alalu from Nibiru was its beginning. With great understanding was Alalu endowed. Much knowledge he by learning acquired by his forefather Anshagal of the heavens and the circuits much knowledge was amassed. By Enshar was knowledge greatly augmented. Of that Alalu made much learning. With the sages he discoursed, savants and commanders he consulted. Thus was knowledge of the beginning ascertained. Thus did Alalu this knowledge possess. The gold in the hammered bracelet was the confirmation. The gold in the hammered bracelet of gold in Tiamat's upper half was the indication. At the planet of gold, Alalu victoriously arrived. That would be us, the earth. His chariot with a thunder crashing, with a beam, he scanned the place, his whereabouts to discover. His chariot on dry land descended. At the edge of extended marshes it landed. He put on an eagle's helmet. He put on a fish's suit. The chariot's hatch he opened. At the open hatch he stopped to wonder. Dark-hued was the ground. Blue-white were the skies. No sound there was. There was no one to bid him welcome. Alone on an alien planet he stood, perchance from Nibiru, forever exiled. 
To the ground himself he lowered. On the dark-hued soil he stepped. There were hills in the distance. Nearby, much vegetation there was. Ahead of him, there were marshes. Into the marsh he stepped. By the water's coolness he shuddered. Back to the dry ground he stepped. Alone on an alien planet he stood. With thoughts he was possessed. Of spouse and offspring with longing he remembered. Was he forever from Nibiru exiled? Of that again and again he wondered. To the chariot he soon returned, with food and drink to be sustained. Then deep sleep him overcame, a powerful slumber. How long he slept he could not remember. What awakened him he could not tell. A brightness there was outside, a, bril a brilliance on Nibiru unseen. A pole from the chariot he extended. With a tester it was equipped. It breathed the planet's air. Compatibility it indicated. The chariot's hatch he opened. At the open hatch he took a breath. Another breath he took. Then another and another. The air of key indeed compatible was. Alleluia clapped his hands. A song of joy he was singing. Without an eagle's helmet, without a fish's suit, to the ground himself he lowered. The brightness outside was blinding. The rays of the sun were overpowering. Into the chariot he returned. A mask for the eyes he donned. He picked up the carried weapon. He picked up the handy sampler. No, I did not make that up. It totally just said handy sampler. To the ground himself he lowered. On the dark-hued soil he stepped. He made his way toward the marshes. Dark greenish were the waters. By the marsh's edge there were pebbles. Alalu picked a pebble. Into the marsh he thrust it. In the marsh, a moving his eyes glimpsed. The waters with fishes were filled. Into the marsh the sampler he lowered. The murky waters to consider. For drinking the water was not fit, Alalu greatly disappointing. He turned away from the marshes, in the direction of the hills he went. He made his way through vegetation. Bushes to trees gave way. The place was like an orchard. The trees with fruits were laden. By their sweet smell enticed, Alalu picked a fruit. In his mouth he put it. Sweet was the smell, sweeter the taste was. Alalu greatly it delighted. Away from the sun's rays, Alalu was walking. Toward the hills he set his direction. Among the trees, a wetness under his feet he sensed, a sign of close-by waters. In the direction of the wetness he set his course. In the midst of the forest there was a pond, a pool of silent waters. Into the pond the sampler he lowered. For drinking, the water was good. Alalu laughed, and unstopping laughter seized him. The air was good, the water for drinking was fit, there was fruit, and there were fishes. With eagerness, Alalu bent down, together his hands he cut. Water to his mouth he brought. A coolness did the water have, a taste from Nibiru's water different. Once more he drank, then with a fright he asunder jumped. A hissing sound he could hear. A slithering body by the poolside was moving. His carried weapon he seized. A blast of its ray towards the hissing he directed. The moving stopped. The hissing was ended. To examine the danger, Alalu stepped forward. The slithered body lay still. Dead was the creature. A sight most strange. Like a rope its long body was. Without hands or feet was the body. Fierce eyes were in its small head. Out of its mouth a long tongue was sticking. A sight on Nibiru never beheld it was, a creature of another world. Was it the orchard's guardian? Alalu by himself pondered. Was it the water's master himself, he asked? In his carried flask he some water collected. With alertness to the chariot he made his way. The sweet fruits he also picked. To the chariot he set his course. 
The brightness of the sun's rays was greatly diminished. Darkness it was as the chariot he reached. The shortness of the day Alalu pondered. Its shortness him amazed. From the direction of the marshes, a cool lightness on the horizon was rising. A white-hued ball in the heavens was quickly rising. Kingu, the earth's companion, he now beheld. What in the account of the beginning, his eyes the truth could now see. The planets and their circuits, the hammered bracelet, Ki, the earth, Kingu, its moon, all created were, all by names were called. In his heart, Alalu knew one more truth a beholding needed. The gold, the means of salvation, to be found was needed. If truth be in the beginning tales, if by the waters the golden veins of Tiamat were washed, in the waters of Ki its cut off half, gold must be found. With hands unsteady, Alalu, the tester, from the chariot's pole dismantled. With trembling hands, the fish's suit he donned the fast-arriving daylight eagerly awaiting. At daybreak, the chariot he exited. To the marshes he quickly stepped. Into deeper waters he waded. The tester into the waters he inserted. Its illuminated face he eagerly watched. In his chest his heart was pounding. The water's contents was the tester indicating. By symbols and numbers its findings disclosing. Then Alalu's heartbeat stopped. There is gold in the waters, the tester was telling. Unsteady on his legs, Alalu stepped forward. Deeper into the marshes, he made his way. Again, he, the tester, into the waters inserted. Again, the tester, gold announced. A cry, a cry of triumph from Alalu's throat emanated. Nibiru's fate in his hands now was. Back to the chariot, he made his way. The fish's suit off he took. The commander's seat he occupied, the tablets of destinies that knows all circuits he enlivened, to Nibiru's circuit to find the direction, the speaker of words he stirred up, toward Nibiru, the words to carry. Then to Nibiru, words he uttered, thus he was saying, the words of the great Alalu to Anu on Nibiru are directed. On another world I am, the gold of salvation I have found. The fate of Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions you must give heed. So as we end the second tablet and get ready to begin the third, we know that Alalu has escaped from Nibiru. He has decided to go forth and find some gold where he knows it to be located on Ki, otherwise known as Earth. Um, after doing some exploration, he has indeed found some gold. You can tell by um, what was discussed here that he had an array of assorted scientific objects and testers and probes to locate the gold. And now that he's found it, he is on his way back to Nibiru. He is radioing to let them know that he's found the gold and that everybody basically has to respect his authority. So here we go, uh, third tablet, and uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. The fate of Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions you must give heed. Those were the words of Alalu from dark-hued earth to Nibiru. They were by the speaker beamed. When the words of Alalu to Anu, the king, were conveyed, Anu astounded was. Astounded were the counselors. Amazed were the sages. Alalu is not dead? They each other asked. Could indeed he be living on another world? They with disbelief were saying. Was he not on Nibiru hiding? In the chariot? To a place of concealment gone? The commanders of chariots were summoned. Savants, the beamed words, were considered. The words from Nibiru did not come. From beyond the hammered bracelet were they spoken. This was their finding. To Anu the king they reported. Stunned was Anu. The happening he pondered. Let the words of acknowledgement to Alalu be sent. To the assembled he was saying, 
At the place of the celestial chariots, the command was given. To Alalu, words were spoken. Anu, the king, to you his greeting sends. Of your well-being to learn, he is pleased. That's because he had the gold. For your departing from Nibiru, there was no reason. Emity is not in Anu's heart. If gold for salvation you have indeed discovered, let Nibiru be saved. The words of Anu, Alalu's chariot did reach. Alalu them quickly answered. If your savior I am to be, your lives to save, convene the princes to assembly, my ancestry declare supreme. Let the commanders make me their leader, bow to my command. Let the council pronounce me king on the throne Anu to replace. When the words of Alalu on Nibiru were heard, great was the consternation. How could Anu be deposed? The counselors asked each other. What if Alalu mischief, not truth, is telling? Where is his asylum? Did gold he indeed find? They summoned the sages of the wise and learned counseling they asked. The oldest of them spoke. I was Alalu's master, he was saying. He had hearkened to teachings of the beginning, of the celestial battle he was learning, of the watery monster Tiamat and her golden veins he knowledge acquired. If indeed beyond the hammered bracelet he had journeyed, on earth the seventh planet is his asylum. In the assembly a prince spoke up. A son of Anu he was. Of the womb of Antu, Anu's spouse, he was the issue. Enlil was his name. Lord of the command, it meant. Words of caution, he was saying. Of conditions Alalu cannot speak. Calamities were his handiwork. By single combat in wrestling, he the throne forfeited. If Tiamat's gold he indeed had found, proof of that is needed. Is it for protecting our atmosphere sufficient? How through the hammered bracelet to Nibiru can it be brought? Thus did Enlil, the son of Anu, speak. Others many questions also asked. Much proof was greatly needed. Many answers are required, all agreed. The words of the assembly to Alalu were conveyed. A response demanded. In other words, Alalu, show us the money. Alalu, the words Merit pondered. To transmit his secrets, he agreed. Of his journey and its perils, in truth, he an account gave. Of the tester, its crystal innards he removed. From the sampler, its crystal heart he took out. Into the speaker, he the crystals inserted, all of the findings to transmit. So he uploaded, <laughs> in other words. Now the proof has been delivered. Declare me king, bow to my command, he sternly demanded. The sages were aghast. With weapons of terror, Alalu on Nibiru, more havoc caused. With weapons of terror, a path through the bracelet he blasted. Once in its circuit, Nibiru, that region passes, calamities Alalu is amassing. In the council, there was much consternation. The kingship to alter was indeed a grave matter. Anu, not by ancestry alone, was king. By fair wrestling, the throne he had attained. In the assembly of the princes, a son of Anu stood up to speak. He was wise in all matters. Among the sages renowned he was. Of the secrets of waters he was a master. Ea, he whose, name, he whose home is water, he was named. Of Anu he was the firstborn. To Damkina, Alalu's daughter, he was espoused. My father by birth is Anu, the king, Ea was saying. Alalu, by marriage, my father is. To bring the two clans into unison, was my espousal's intention. Let me be the one in this conflict unity to bring. Let me Anu's emissary to Alalu be. Let me be the one Alalu's discoveries to uphold. Let me in a chariot to earth journey, a path through the bracelet with water, not fire I shall fashion. On earth, from the waters, let me the precious gold obtain. To Nibiru, back it will be sent. Let Alalu be king on earth, 
a verdict of the sages is awaiting. If Nibiru it will save, let there be a second wrestling. Who shall Nibiru rule, let it determine. The princes, the counselors, the sages, the commanders heard Ea's words with wonder. Full of wisdom they were. For conflict, they solution found. Let it so be, Anu announced. Let Ea journey, let the gold be tested. Alalu, a second time, I shall then wrestle. They really liked wrestling, in case you haven't noticed that. Let the winner be on Nibiru King. Maybe we should have our elections determined by naked wrestling. That might be kind of intriguing. Could definitely raise some money with pay-per-view. Okay, back to the story. The words of decision to Alalu were conveyed. He pondered them and agreed. Let Ea, my son by marriage, to earth come. Let gold from the waters be obtained. Let it for salvation on Nibiru be tested. Let a second wrestling kingship by me or Anu settle. So be it. Anu in the assembly decreed. Enlil rose in objection. How typical of Enlil. The king's word unalterable was. Ea to the place of the chariots went. Commanders and sages he consulted. The mission's dangers he contemplated. How to extract and bring the gold he considered. Alalu's transmission he carefully studied. Alalu for more testings the results he requested. A tablet of destinies for the mission he was fashioning. If water be the force, where could it be replenished? Where on the chariot will it be stored? How to force will it be converted? A full circuit of Nibiru did pass in contemplations. A shar of Nibiru in preparations passed. The largest celestial chariot for the mission has been fitted. In circuit's destiny has been calculated. A tablet of destiny has been firmly fixed. Fifty heroes will for the mission be required to journey to earth, the gold to obtain. To the journey, Anu, his approval gave. The stargazers for the journey, the right time to begin, then selected. At the place of the chariots, multitudes gathered. To bid farewell to the heroes and their leader, did they come. Bearing eagles' helmets, carrying each a fish's suit, the heroes, the heroes, the chariot, one by one entered. The last to embark was Ea. To the gathering he bade farewell. Before his father Anu he knelt down, the king's blessing to receive. My son, the firstborn, a far journey you have undertaken for us all to be endangered. Let your success calamity from Nibiru banish. Go and in safety come back. So did Anu to his son speak a blessing, bidding him farewell. The mother of Ea, the one called Ninul, to her heart embraced him. Why, after by Anu, as a son to me you were given, did he with a restless heart you endow? Go and come back, the hazardous road traverse safely to him, she said. With tenderness, Ea kissed his spouse, Damkina. He, without words, embraced. Enlil, with his half-brother, locked arms. Be blessed, be successful to him, he said. With heavy heart, Ea, the chariot, entered to soar up the command he gave. Now this is the account of the journey to the seventh planet, and how the legend of the fish god who came from the waters has begun. With heavy heart, Ea, the chariot, entered to soar up the command he gave. The commander's seat by Anzu, not by Ea, was occupied. Anzu, not Ea, was the chariot's commander. He who knows the heavens, his name's meaning was, for the task he was especially selected. A prince among the princes he was, of royal seed his aunt's ancestry he counted. The celestial chariot he deftly guided, from Nibiru it powerfully soared. Toward the distant sun he it directed. Ten leagues, a hundred leagues, the chariot was coursing. A thousand leagues the chariot was journeying. Little Gaga came out to greet them, a welcome to the heroes it was extending. To blue-hued Anzu, the beautiful enchantress, it showed the way. By her sight, Anzu was attracted. Let us examine her waters, Anzu was saying. Ea, to continue without stopping, gave the word. It is a planet of no return, 
he forcefully said. Toward the heavenly on, the third in planetary counts, the chariot continued. On his side was on lying. His host of moons about him were whirling. The tester's beams, the presence of water was revealing. A stop, if needed, to Ea it was indicating. To, in, to continue the journey was Ea saying, towards Anshar, the heaven's foremost prince he was directing. Soon the ensnaring pull of Anshar, they could tell, his colored rings with fear they admired. Deftly did Anzu the chariot guide, the crushing dangers he cleverly avoided. The giant Kishar, foremost of the firm planets, was next to be encountered. Her net's pull was overpowering. With great skill did Anzu the chariot's course divert. With fury, Kishar at the chariot, divine lightnings was thrusting. Her host at the uninvited, she directed. Slowly, Kishar moved away for the chariot, the next enemy to encounter. Beyond the fifth planet, the hammered bracelet was lurking. Ea, his handiwork to set a whirring, commanded the water thruster to prepare. Toward the host of turning boulders, the chariot was rushing. Each one, like a slingshot's stone, ferociously at the chariot aimed. The word by Ea was given. With the force of a thousand heroes, the stream of water was thrust. One by one, the boulders turned face, a path for the chariot they were making. But as one boulder fled, another in its stead was attacking. A multitude beyond count was their number, a host for the splitting of Tiamat, revenge seeking. Again and again, Ea the commands gave, the water thruster to keep a whirring. Again and again, towards the host of boulders, streams of water were directed. Again and again, the boulders, their faces turned, a path for the chariot making. And then at last the path was clear. Unharmed, the chariot should continue. A cry of joy, the heroes sounded. Double was the joy as the sight of the sun was now unveiled. Amidst the elation, Anzu, the alarm sounded, for the path to a fashioned excessive waters were consumed. Waters to feed the chariot's fiery stones for the remaining journey were not sufficient. In the dark deepness, the sixth planet they could see, the sun's rays it was reflecting. There is water on Lamu, Ea was saying. Can you bring the chariot down upon it? Anzu, he was asking. Deftly, Anzu, the chariot toward Lamu, directed. Reaching the celestial god, around it, he, the chariot, made circle. The planet's net is not great. Its pull is to handle easily, Anzu was saying. A sight to behold was Lamu. Many-hued it was. Snow white was its cap. Snow white were its sandals. Reddish-hued was its middle. In the midst, lakes and rivers were a glitter. Deftly, Anzu, the chariot, made travel slower. By a lakeside it gently came down. Ea and Anzu, their eagle's helmets donned, to the firm ground they stepped down. On command, the heroes that which water sucks extended, the chariot's bowels with the lake's waters to refill. While the chariot was getting its fill of waters, Ea and Anzu, the whereabouts examined. With tester and sampler, all that matters, they ascertained. The waters were good for drinking, the air was sufficient. All was in the chariot's annals recorded. The need for the detour described. So it's captain's log, detour to Lamu, to get some water. With its figure replenished, the chariot soared up. To the benevolent Lamu, farewell bidding. Beyond the seventh planet was making its circuit. Earth and its companion, the chariot, were inviting. In the commander's seat, Anzu was without words. Ea, too, was silent. Ahead was their destination, its gold Nibiru's fate for salvation or doom containing. The chariot must be slowed, or in Earth's thick atmosphere it shall perish, Anzu to Ea declared. Around Earth's companion, the moon, make slowing circles, Ea to him suggested. They encircled the moon by the vanquishing Nibiru in the celestial battle it prostrate and scarred was lying. Having the chariot thus slowed down towards the seventh planet, Anzu the chariot directed. Once, twice the earth's globe, he made the chariot circle. Ever closer to the firm land, he lowered it. Snow-hued was two-thirds of the planet. 
dark hued was its middle. They could see the oceans, they could see the firm lands for the signal beacon from Alalu they were searching. Where an ocean touched dry land, where four rivers were swallowed by marshes, Alalu's signal was beaconed. Too heavy and large the chariot is for the marshes, Anzu was declaring. The earth's pulling net, too powerful for on dry land to descend it was, Anzu to Ea announced. Splash down, splash down in the ocean's water, Ea to Anzu shouted. Around the planet, Anzu made one more circuit. The chariot, with much care, towards the ocean's edge he lowered. The chariot's lungs he filled with air. Into the waters, down it splashed. Into the depths, it was not sinking. From the speaker, a voice was heard. To earth be welcomed, Alalu was saying. By his beamed words, the direction of his whereabouts was determined. Nice that the chariot came equipped with the uh, PA system. Towards the place Anzu the chariot directed, floating as a boat it was upon the waters moving. Soon the wide-ranging ocean narrowed. Dry land on both sides as Guardian appeared. On the left side, brown-hued hills were rising. On the right, mountains to heavens. Heaven, their heads raised. Toward the place of Alalu was the chariot moving, floating like a boat upon the waters it was. Ahead, the dry land was covered with flooding. Flooding marshes the oceans were replacing. Anzu to heroes' commands uttered. Their fishes' suits to put on, he ordered. A hatch of the chariot was then opened. Into the marshes the heroes descended. Strong ropes to the chariot they attached. With the ropes, the chariot they were pulling. Alalu's beamed words were more powerful, more becoming. Hurry, hurry, he was saying. At the edge of the marshes, a sight there was to behold. Gleaming in the sun rays was a chariot from Nibiru. Alalu's celestial boat it was. The heroes, their paces quickened. Toward Alalu's chariot, they hurried. Impatient, Ea donned his fish's suit. Within his chest, his heart was like a drum beating. Into the marsh he jumped, towards its edge, hurried steps he directed. High were the marshes flooding. Deeper was the bottom than he, inspect, than he expected. He changed his gait to swimming. With bold strokes forward he advanced. As dry land he was approaching. Green meadows he could see. I just want to say that they can navigate their way across like God only knows how many millions of light years, but they can't splash down in the proper location or land on the earth. <laughs> Seems a little strange to me. Anyway, then his feet touched firm ground. He stood up and by walking he continued. Ahead he could see Alalu standing with his hands with vigor waving. Come out of the waters ashore, Ea stepped. On dark-hued earth, he was standing. Alalu toward him came running. His son by marriage he powerfully embraced. Welcome to a different planet, Alalu to Ea said. Now this is the account of how Eridu on earth was established. How the count of seven days was begun. In silence did Alalu Ea embrace. With tears of joy his eyes were filled. Before him, Ea bowed his head, respect for his father by marriage he was showing. In the marshes, the heroes were advancing. More donned fishes suits, more towards the dry land were rushing. Keep the chariot afloat, Anzu was commanding. In the waters, anchor it. The mud ahead, avoiding. Ashore stepped the heroes. Before Alalu, they were bowing. Ashore came Anzu, the last chariot to depart. Before Alalu, he bowed. With him, Alalu in welcome locked arms. To all who had arrived, Alalu words of welcome spoke. To all who were assembled, Ea words of command spoke. Here on earth, I am the commander, he was saying. On a life or death mission, we have come. In our hands is Nibiru's fate. He looked about for a place for encampment. He was searching. Heap up soil. Mounds fashioned there, Ea gave command an encampment to set up. To a place not afar he was pointing, a reed hut abode by Alalu erected. To Anzu then, words he directed. To Nibiru, words by beaming deliver. 
to the king my father Anu, successful arrival announced. Soon the hue of the skies was changing, from brightness to reddish it was turning. A sight never seen before by their eyes was unfolding. The sun, as a red ball on the horizon, was disappearing. Fear seized the heroes of a great calamity, afraid they were. Alalu with laughter, words of comfort, was saying, A setting of the sun it is, the ending of one day on earth it is marking. For a quick rest lie down, a night on earth is beyond imagining short. Before you expect the sun will make an appearance. On earth it will be morning. Before expecting darkness came, the heavens from the earth it separated. Lightnings the darkness pierced, rains the thunders followed. By winds were the waters blown, storms of an alien god they were. In the chariot the heroes hunkered down, in the chariot the heroes huddled. They came all that way and they're scared of a freaking thunderstorm. You can't make this stuff up. Resting to them did not come. They were greatly agitated. With quickened hearts the sun's return they awaited. Smiling when its rays appeared they were, joyful and backslapping. And it was evening, and it was morning, their first day on earth it was, by daybreak Ea the ongoings considered. To separate waters from waters heed he was giving. Anger he made of the sweet waters, the master drinking waters to provide. To the snake pond with Alalu he went, its sweet waters to consider. Evil serpents in the pond were swarming, so did anger to Ea say. The marshlands Ea then contemplated, the abundance of rainwaters he weighed. And Belulu he placed in charge of the marshlands to mark out the thicket of reeds, him he directed. And Kimdu in charge of ditch and dike he placed, a boundary for the marshes to fashion, for the waters that the heaven rain a gathering place to make. Thus were the waters below from the waters above separated, marsh waters from sweet waters asunder were set. And it was evening, and it was morning, the second day on earth it was. When the sun, morning, announced the heroes their assigned tasks were performing. With Alalu, Ea to the place of grass and trees his steps directed. All that in the orchard grows herbs and fruits after their kind to examine. To Izamud, his vizier, Ea questions was addressing. What is this plant? What is that plant? Him, he was asking. Izamud, one of much learning, food that grows well, he could distinguish. He tore a fruit for Ea, a honey plant it is. To Ea, he was saying, one fruit he himself ate. One fruit Ea was eating. A food that grows by its good distinguished Ea, the hero guru, put in charge. Thus were the heroes water and food provided, satiated that they were not. And it was evening, and it was morning, the third day on earth it was. On the fourth day the wind ceased blowing, the chariot by waves was not disturbed. Let tools from the chariot be brought, let abodes in the encampment be built, Ea thus commanded. Kula, in charge of mold and brick, Ea appointed, from the clay bricks to fashion, Mushdamu, to lay foundations he directed, dwelling abodes to erect. All day the sun was shining, the great light by day it was. By eve time, Kingu, the earth's moon, in fullness a pale light on earth it cast, a lesser light to rule the night among the celestial gods accounted to be. And it was evening, and it was morning, the fourth day on earth it was. On the fifth day, Ea, Ningursig, a boat of reeds to fashion commanded, the measure of the marshes to take, the stretch of the swamp lands to consider. Ulmash, he who what in the water swarms knows, who a fowl that fly has understanding. Ulmash as a companion Ea took between good and bad to distinguish, kinds that in the water swarm, kinds that in the sky give wing. To Ulmash many were unknown. Bewildering was their number. Good were the carp, among the bad they were, swimming. And Belulu, the marshland's master, Ea summoned. 
and Kimdu in charge of Ditch and Dyke, Ea summoned. To them, he gave words in the marshlands to make a barrier, with cane breaks and green reeds an enclosure to fashion. Fish from fish there separate, a trap for carp that from a net could not escape. A place whose snare no bird that is good for food could escape. Thus were fish and fowl by their good kind separated, for the heroes provided. And it was evening, and it was morning, the fifth day on earth it was. On the sixth day, Ea of the orchard's creatures took account, and Nursog to the task he assigned, that which creeps and that which on feet walks to distinguish. Their kinds, and Nursog astounded of the ferocity of the wilderness to Ea an account he gave. Ea Kula summoned to Mushdamu urgent commands he gave, by eve time the abodes to be completed, by a fence for protection to be surrounded. The heroes to the task put their shoulders, bricks on the foundations were quickly laid. With reeds were the roofings made, of cut down trees was the fencing put up. Anzu, a beam that kills from the chariot brought over, a speaker that words beams at Ea's abode set up. By eve time complete was the encampment. For the night therein the heroes gathered. Ea and Alalu and Anzu, the doings considered, all that was done indeed was good. And it was evening, and it was morning, the sixth day. On the seventh day, the heroes in the encampment were assembled. To them Ea spoke these words. A hazardous journey we have undertaken. From Nibiru to the seventh planet, a dangerous way we traversed. At earth, we with success arrived, much good we attained, an encampment we have established. Let this day be a day of rest, the seventh day hereafter, a day of resting always to be. Let this place henceforth by the name Eridu be called, home in the far away, the meaning thereof will be. Let a promise be kept. Let Alalu of Eridu, the commander, be declared. The heroes thus assembled in unison agreement shouted, Words of consent Alalu uttered, then homage to Ea he greatly paid. Let Ea a second name be given. Nudamud, the artful fashioner, let him be called. In unison the hero's agreement announced. And it was evening, and it was morning, the seventh day. As we continue our third tablet, let's just regroup here a minute. Um, we have seen Ea come from Nibiru with a great big group of heroes. They spent one entire shar, which in Earth years is nearly 4,000 years. Um, they took an entire shar to basically come up with a spacecraft that would make the journey with a group of people and all of the appropriate instrumentation. And rather than by fire, as Alulu did, with water they came to Earth making a stop to get more water and they found Alalu. They basically took six days to take account of all of the things in the surrounding area, all the things they could eat, all the things that they needed. They built a house, an encampment, they set up all the gear from their ship and on the seventh day they basically rested and they sang praises to each other and they probably who knows, got drunk and had some naked wrestling and did that Anunnaki kind of thing. And uh, now the real purpose for coming to Earth begins. So let's go. Now this is the account of how the searching for gold was begun and how the plans on Nibiru made to Nibiru's salvation did not provide. After the encampment of Eridu was established and the heroes with food were satisfied, Ea, the task of gold, from the waters obtaining started. In the chariot the firestones were stirred up, its great cracker was enlivened. That which water sucks from the chariot was extended into the marsh waters it was inserted. So they're draining the marshlands, basically. Into a vessel of crystals the waters were directed. From the waters the crystals all that is metal in the vessel extracted. Then from the vessel that which spits out the waters to the fish pond spat out. Thus were the metals that were in the waters in the vessel collected. 
Ingenious was Eos' handiwork, an artful fashioner indeed he was. For six earth days, marsh waters were sucked in, marsh waters were spat out. In the vessel, metals were indeed collected. The metals on the seventh day by Ea and Alalu were examined. Of many kinds were the metals in the vessel. Iron there was, much copper there was, of gold there was no abundance. In the chariot, another vessel, the artful handiwork of Nudamud, the metals after their kinds were separated, ashore kind by kind they were carried. For six days thus did the heroes toil. On the seventh day they rested. For six days were the crystal vessels filled and emptied. On the seventh day were the metals accounted. There was iron, there was copper, and other metals too. Of the gold, the smallest pile was accumulated. In the night times, the moon waxed and waned. By the name month did Ea its circuit call. At month's very start, its luminous horns six days signify. By its half crown the seventh day it announced, a day to rest it was. At midway, by a fullness was the moon distinguished. Then it paused to become diminished. When the sun's course was the moon's circuit appearing, with earth's circuit it was its face revealing. Fascinated by the moon's motions was Ea. Its attachment as Kingu to Ki he contemplated. What purpose did the attachment serve? What heavenly sign was it giving? A month did Ea the moon's circuit call. Month to its circuit he gave the name. For one month, for two months, in the chariot were the waters separated. The sun, every six months, to earth another season gave. Winter and summer did Ea by names them call. There was winter and there was summer. By year of earth did Ea the full circuit call. By year's end of the accumulated gold account was taken. Much to dispatch to Nibiru there was not. The swamplands waters are deficient. Let the chariot to the deeper ocean be moved, so was Ea saying. From its moorings was the chariot untied. Back whence it came, it was shifted. With great care were the crystal vessels stirred up, the salt waters through them passing. Metals by their kinds were separated. Gold among them was sparkling. From the chariot of the happenings, Ea to Nibiru word did be. Anu to hear it was pleased indeed. In his destined circuit, Nibiru to the sun's abode was returning. A closeness to earth on its shar circuit was Nibiru attaining. With eagerness did Anu about the gold inquire. Is there enough for sending to Nibiru, he was asking? Alas, not enough was the gold from the waters collected. Let another shar pass. Let the quantity be doubled, Ea to Anu counseled. From the earth's waters the obtaining of gold continued. In his heart, Ea with apprehension was filling. From the chariot parts were hauled out, a sky chamber from them was assembled. Abgal, he who knows piloting of the sky chamber to take charge, he appointed. Daily in the sky chamber with Abgal did Ea upward soar, the earth and its secrets to learn. For the sky chamber an enclosure was constructed by Alalu's chariot was it placed. Daily the crystals in Alalu's chariot did Ea study. What by their beams was discovered to understand? Whence does the gold come? He asked Alalu. Where on earth are Tiamat, Tiamat's golden veins? In the sky chamber with Abgal did Ea upward soar, the earth and its secrets to learn. Over great mountains they roamed. In the valleys, great rivers they saw. Steps and forests below were stretched. Thousands of leagues was their reach. Vast lands separated by oceans they recorded. With the beam that scans, the soils they penetrated. On Nibiru, impatience was growing. Can gold protection provide? Was the outcry increasing. Assemble the gold. On Nibiru's nearing gold, you must deliver. So did Anu, Ea, command. Repair Alalu's chariot for returning to Nibiru. Make it fit for the Shah's completion. Make it ready. So was Anu saying. 
Ea, his father's, the king's words were heeding, the repairing of Alalu's chariot he was contemplating. As the sky chamber, one eve by the side of the chariot they landed. With Abgal, the chariot they entered, a secret deed in the darkness to perform. The weapons of terror, the seven of them, from the chariot they removed. To the sky chamber they took them. Inside the sky chamber, them to give hiding. By sunrise, Ea, with Abgal, in the sky chamber soared. To another land was their direction. There, in a secret place, did Ea, the weapons, hide. In a cave, a place unknown, he stored them. Then to Anzu, Ea, words of command gave. To repair Alalu's chariot, he him directed, for returning to Nibiru, to make it fit by the Shah's completion, to make it ready. Anzu, in the ways of chariots, greatly skilled to the task his labor set. He made its thrusters hum again, its tablets he carefully considered. The absence of weapons of terror he soon discovered. With anger, Anzu cried out. Ea of the hiding away gave the explanation. Forsworn is the weapon's use, Ea was saying. Neither in the heavens nor on the firm lands shall they ever be harnessed. Without them, no passage through the hammered bracelet is safe, Anzu was saying. Without them, without water thrusters, the danger is endurance surpassing. Alalu of Eridu, the commander, the words of Ea considered. To the words of Anzu, heed he gave. The words of Ea by the council of Nibiru are attested, Alalu was saying. But without the chariot's return, Nibiru shall be doomed. Abgal, he who knows piloting, boldly towards the leader stepped forward. I shall be the pilot. The dangers I shall valiantly face, he was saying. Thus was the decision made. Abgal shall be the pilot. Anzu on earth shall be staying. On Nibiru, the stargazers, the destinies of the celestial gods contemplated. An opportune day they were selecting. Into Alalu's chariot, basketfuls of gold were carried. The forepart of the chariot Abgal entered, the commander's seat he occupied. From the chariot of Ea, to him Ea a tablet of destiny gave. It shall be that which shows the way for you. By it shall be opened a pathway you shall find. The chariot's fire stones Abgal stirred up, their hum like a music, was enthralling. The chariot's great cracker he enlivened, a reddish brilliance it was casting. Ea and Alalu, the multitude of heroes, were standing around. Farewell to him they were bidding. Then the chariot with a roar heavenward rose, to the heavens it ascended. To Nibiru words of the ascent were beamed. On Nibiru there was much expecting. As we head towards the fourth tablet, um, we see that finally there is going to be a closer passing of Nibiru, as in the coming of a new Shar, and they have outfitted Alalu's chariot to bring a gold shipment to Nibiru, as that was pretty much the whole purpose of this entire exercise, was to bring gold to Nibiru for their atmosphere. So, um... One thing I will point out is that you may have noticed Anki sort of had issue with Alalu's chariot having weapons on them. These terror weapons that are repeatedly mentioned um, will continue to be mentioned, and Anki does not seem to like the fact that Alalu might be headed towards the home planet with these weapons intact, and he uh, previously wanted them to be hidden someplace. This will be a continuing theme with Anki and various weapons um, and his concern for them not being used. Not that I'm overly defensive of Anki's position on weapons, but nonetheless. Um, let's continue with the fourth tablet. To Nibiru words of the ascent were beamed. On Nibiru there was much expecting. With confidence was Abgal the chariot guiding. Around Kingu the moon he made a circuit, by its net powers speed to gain, a thousand leagues, ten thousand leagues, towards Lamu he journeyed. Lamu is Mars, probably, um, just so you know. 
by its net power, a direction towards Nibiru to, to obtain. Beyond Lamu, the hammered bracelet was a whirling. Deftly did Abgal's Ea's crystals make a glow, the open paths to locate. The eye of fate upon him with favor looked. Beyond the bracelet, the chariot beam signals from Nibiru was receiving. Homeward, homeward was the direction. Again, in the darkness, in a reddish hue glowed Nibiru, a sight to behold it was. By the beamed signals, the chariot was now directed. Thrice around Nibiru, it made circuits by, it net, by its net force to be slowed. Nearing the planet, the breach in its atmosphere Abgal could see. A squeezing in his heart he felt, of the gold he was bringing, he was thinking. Passing through the atmosphere's thickness, a glow was the chariot, its heat overbearing. Deftly did Abgal spread the chariot's wings, its descent thereby arresting. Beyond lay the place of the chariots, a sight most inviting. Gently did Abgal the chariot bring down to a place by the beams selected. He opened the hatch. A multitude of populace was there assembled. Anu towards him stepped forward, locked arms, warm greetings uttered. Heroes in the chariot rushed, the gold-bearing baskets they brought out. High above their heads they the baskets held. To the assembled, words of victory Anu shouted. Salvation is here, to them he was saying. To the place was Abgal accompanied, to rest and tell all he was escorted. The gold, a sight most dazzling, by the savants was quickly taken. To make of its finest dust, to skyward launch it was hauled away. A shard did the fashioning last, a shard did the testing continue. With rockets was the dust heavenward carried, by crystal's beams was it dispersed. So they've taken the gold that was brought from earth, and by rockets and other various means, they are now firing it into the breach in Nibiru's atmosphere. Very interesting. Where there was a breach, now there was a healing. Joy the palace filled, abundance in the land was expected. To earth, Anu, good words, was beaming. Gold gives salvation, the obtaining of gold do continue. When Nibiru near the sun came, the golden dust was by its rays disturbed. The healing in the atmosphere was dwindled. The breach to bigness returned. Anu, the return of Abgal to earth then commanded. In the chariot more hero heroes traveled. In its bowels more that which the water sucks in and thrusts out were provided. With them Nungal to travel was commanded, a pilot helper to Abgal to become. Great joy there was when Abgal to Eridu returned, many greetings and the locking of arms there was. The new water workings Ea with care contemplated. There was smiling on his face, in his heart there was a squeezing. By Shar time, Nungal in the chariot was to depart ready. In its bowels the chariot only a few baskets of gold carried. The disappointment on Nibiru, Ea's heart to him was predicting. Ea with Alalu words exchanged, that which was known they reconsidered. If earth the head of Tiamat was, in the celestial battle cut off, where was the neck? Where were the golden veins cut asunder? Where was the golden veins from earth's innards protruding? In the sky chamber, Ea over mountains and valleys traveled. The lands by oceans separated, he with the scanner examined. Again and again, there was the same indication. Where dry land from dry land apart was torn, Earth's innards were revealed. Where the landmass, the shape of a heart was given, in the lower part thereof, golden veins from Earth's innards were abundant. Abzu, the gold of the birthplace, Ea to the region the name gave. Ea then to Anu words of wisdom beamed. With gold earth indeed is filled from the veins. Not from the waters the gold must be gotten. From earth's bowels, not from its waters, must the gold be obtained. From a region beyond the ocean, Abzu it shall be called, 
can an abundance of gold be gotten? In the palace there was great astonishment. Savants and counselors to Ea's words gave consideration. That gold must be obtained. On that unanimity, unanimity there was how to obtain it from the bowels of the earth. Of that there was much discussion. In the assembly a prince spoke up, Enlil he was, the half-brother of Ea. First Alalu, then his son by marriage, Ea upon waters placed all hope. Of salvation by water's gold they were reassuring. Shar after shar, all of us salvation were expecting. Now different words we are hearing. A task beyond imagining to undertake. Proof of the golden veins is needed. A plan for success must be ensured. So was Enlil to the assembly saying. To his words many in agreement listened. Let Enlil go to earth, Anu was saying. Let him proof obtain, a plan put forward. His words shall be heeded, his words a command shall be. In unanimity, the assembly its consent gave. Enlil's mission is... Okay, so what's happened here so far? Um, Anu has come from Nibiru to sort of settle things and make sure that gold gets delivered in a prompt and efficient manner. And clearly Enki and Enlil are having some difficulties. And of course there's the issue of the fact that they're half-brothers. Enki is the son of Anu by means of a concubine. Enlil is the rightful and legitimate heir to the throne on Nibiru. Um, not to mention the fact that there's also the presence of Alulu, who is basically the one who knew that the gold was on Nibiru, who found it, and who radioed back to Nibiru, hey, guess what I've got? Um, so when Anu shows up, he has to uh, designate the authority to do various tasks and uh, delegate various responsibilities. And in so doing, he leaves Alalu out. Now, Alalu had every intention of returning to Nibiru and usurping the throne because he was the one who found the gold. Without gold, Nibiru cannot survive. Um, it doesn't have a normal orbit, and its presence near the sun um, doesn't afford it an atmosphere. So without this sort of powderized gold, there can be no life on Nibiru. So basically, he who finds the gold should be the king. So what happens here is Anu draws straws or draws lots with his sons, and somehow Anu manages to get to go back to Nibiru and he delegates the various responsibilities to Ea, now known as Enki, and to Enlil, and leaves Alalu out. Well, Alalu is pretty disgusted, so once again we have a naked wrestling, and in this situation Anu basically thrashes uh, Alalu, Anu thrashes, you know, the guy that he thrashed once before. Well, as he's proclaiming victory, Alalu bites off Anu's um, ween and swallows it. So now we have Alalu being rushed back to a reed hut so that Anu doesn't kill him, and Anu is now without his ween. So we have to sort out how things are going to go down. I don't really know what to make of this, but it's it's quite an interesting story to say the very least. Now this is the account of the judging of Alalu and of the happenings thereafter on earth and on Lamu. In his reed hut Anu was hurting. I bet. In the reed hut to him Enki applied the healing. In his reed hut Alalu was sitting spittle he spat from his mouth in his innards the malehood of anu was like a burden with anu's semen were his innards impregnated like a female in travail his belly grew swollen oh those crazy anunnaki on the third day anu's pain subsided his pride was greatly hurting to nimiru i wish to return to his two sons anu did say Beforehand upon Alalu, there must be a judgment, a sentence the crime befitting must be imposed. By the laws of Nibiru, seven judges were required, 
the highest of rank on them to preside. In the square of Eridu, the heroes were assembled, the trial of Awalu to observe. For the seven who judge, seven seats were provided. For Anu presiding, the tallest seat was prepared. To his right, Enki was seated. Enlil was seated on Anu's left. That's a little bit symbolic. On Enki's right, Anzu and Nungal were seated. Abgal and Algar to the left of Enlil sat. Before these seven who judge, Alalu was brought. His hands and feet were untied. Enlil was first to speak. In fairness, a wrestling match was held. Alalu, the kingship to Anu forfeited. What say you, Alalu? Enki him, this question asked. In fairness, the wrestling match was held. The kingship I forfeited, Alalu said. Having been vanquished, Alalu, an abominable crime performed. The male hood of Anu he bit and swallowed. Thus did Enlil the accusation of the crime make. Death is the punishment, Enlil was saying. What say you, Alalu? Anki, his father by marriage, asked. There was silence. Alalu, the question, did not answer. We all the crime did witness, Oligar was saying. Judgment must be in accordance. If words you wish to utter, speak before the judging, Enki to Alalu said. In the silence, Alalu slowly began to speak. On Nibiru, I was a king. By right of succession, I was reigning. Anu was my cup-bearer. The princes he aroused to a wrestling. He, me, challenged. For nine counted circuits, I was king on Nibiru. To my seed, kingship was belonging. On my throne seat, Anu himself sat. To escape death, to distant earth, I made a dangerous journey. Salvation for Nibiru, I, Alalu, on the alien planet discovered. Return to Nibiru, I was promised, in fairness, the throne to regain. Then to earth came Ea the one who by compromise the next to reign Nibiru he was designated. Then came Enlil, the succession from Anu to himself claiming. Then Anu came, by lots he tricked Ea, Enki, the lord of earth he was proclaimed, of earth not of Nibiru to be the master. Then to Enlil command was granted, Enki to the distant Abzu was delegated. My heart of all that was aching, my chest from shame and anger was bursting. Then Anu, his foot upon my chest placed, upon my aching heart he was treading. In the silence Anu spoke up. By royal seed and law, by fair wrestling did I gain the throne. My malehood you bit off and swallowed, my offspring line to discontinue. Enlil spoke up. To the crime the accused admitted. Let the judgment come. Let death the punishment be. You might notice Enlil's always in favor of death, no matter what the question or matter at hand might be. If Enlil has a say in it, somebody's going to die. Death, said Aligar. Death, said Abgal. Death, said Nungal. Death to Alalu by itself will be coming. What he had swallowed in his innards death will bring, Enki was saying. That's not very nice. Let Alalu for the rest of his days on earth be in prison, Anzu was saying. Their words Anu was contemplating. Anger and pity both him engulfed. To die in exile. Let this be the judgment, Anu was saying. In amazement, the judges at each other's glanced. What Anu was saying, they wondered. Neither on earth nor on Nibiru shall the exiling be, Anu was saying. On the way, there is the Lamu planet with waters and an atmosphere it is endowed. Again, Lamu is Mars. Enki as Ea thereon made a pause. Of it as a way station have I been thinking. Its net force is less than that of Earth forceful, an advantage in wisdom to be considered. In the celestial chariot, Alalu shall be taken. On my departing from Earth, he with me shall make the journey. Around the planet Lamu 
we shall make circuits. To Alalu a sky chamber we shall provide. To the planet Lamu in it he will be descended. Alone on a strange planet in exile he shall be. His days to his last day by himself to count. Thus did Anu words of judgment utter. In solemnity were the words intended. By unanimity was the judgment upon Alalu imposed. In the presence of the heroes it was announced. Let Nungal be my pilot to Nibiru, therefrom chariots bearing heroes again to earth to pilot. Let Anzu join for the journey of the descent to Lamu, take charge. So did Anu commandments utter. On the morrow departing was ready. All who depart by boats to the chariot were ferried. A place for landings on firm soil you must prepare, Anu to Enlil was saying. How Lamu as a way station to utilize, plans you should be making. Farewells there were, both joy and sorrow. Limping did Anu on the chariot embark. You really just cannot make this stuff up. The man has lost his ween. Limping did Anu on the chariot embark. And he didn't even sentence the ween biter to death. Okay, I'm just saying. I thought that was pretty nice and pretty human of Anu to allow the wean biter to live. With hands tied did Alalu the chariot enter. They should have tied his mouth shut <laughs> in case he had designs on somebody else's maleness. Then to the heavens the chariot soared up and the royal visit had ended. And what a visit it was. They around the moon made a circuit. Anu by the sight was enchanted. Toward the red-hued Lamu they journeyed. Twice about it they circled. Lower toward the strange planet they came, mountains sky high, and tears in the surface they noted. Huh, tears in the surface of Mars, what do you know? Where Ea's chariot had once landed they observed. By a lakeside it was located. Slowed by, slowed by Lamu's net power, in the chariot the sky chamber they readied. Anzu, its pilot, then unexpected words to Anu was saying, With Alalu to the firm soil of Lamu I shall descend, with the sky chamber to the chariot to return I wish not. With Alalu on the strange planet I shall stay, until he dies I shall protect him. When he dies of his innards poison, as befits a king, him I shall bury. As for me, I shall have made my name. Anzu, they will say, against all odds, to a king in exile a companion was. He saw things by others unseen. On a strange planet, he faced unknown things. Anzu, they will to the end of time, shall say, like a hero, has fallen. There were tears in the eyes of Alalu. There was amazement in the heart of Anu. Your wish shall be honored to Anzu, Anu said. Hereby let a promise by me to you be made. By my raised hand to you, I this swear. On the next journey, a chariot by Lamu shall circuit. Its skyship to you shall descend. If alive, it shall find you. The master of Lamu, you shall be proclaimed. That's very nice of him. When a way station on Lamu shall be established, its commander you shall be. Anzu bowed his head. So be it, to Anu, he said. Into the sky chamber Alalu and Anzu were ushered. With eagles' helmets and fishes' suits they were provided. With food and tools they were supplied. From the circling chariot the sky ship departed. From the chariot its descent was observed. Then from view it disappeared, and the chariot to Nibiru continued. For nine shars was Alalu king on Nibiru. For eight shars Eridu he commanded. In the ninth shar to die in exile on Lamu was his fate. Now this is the account of the return of Anu to Nibiru, and how Alalu on Lamu was buried. How Enlil on earth the landing place built. On Nibiru, there was for Anu a joyous welcome. 
of what had happened to the council and the princes on who gave account. Neither pity nor vengeance from them all he sought. To discuss the tasks ahead, he them all instructed. To the assembled a vision great in scope he outlined. Way stations from Nibiru to Earth to establish all the sun's family in one kingdom to encompass, the first on Lamu to be fashioned, the moon for the plans to be considered, on the other planets or their circling host stations to be set up, a chain, a constant caravan of chariots to supply and safeguard, the gold from Earth without interruptions to Nibiru ring, perchance gold elsewhere to also find, the counselors, the princes, the savants, on whose plans considered. The salvation of Nibiru in the plans they all a promise saw. Savants and commanders' knowledge of the celestial gods perfected. To chariots and sky ships, a new kind, rocket ships, were added. Heroes for the tasks were selected. For the task there was much learning. The plans to Enki and Enlil were beamed over. Preparations on earth to hurry, they were told. On earth of what had happened and what to be done is required, there was much discussion. Enki Aligar to be of Eridu, the overseer, appointed. His own steps to the Abzu, he directed. Where to obtain gold from earth's bowels, he then determined. What heroes to the task are needed, he calculated. What tools were required, he contemplated. An earth splitter, with cleverness Enki designed, on the beer that it be fashioned, he requested. Therewith in the earth to make a gash, its innards reach by way of tunnels, that which crunches and that which crushes, he also designed, on Nibiru for the Abzu to be fashioned. Of other matters Nibiru's savants he to contemplate asked. Of matters of health and well-being of heroes, the needs he listed. To the heroes, Earth's quick circuits were upsetting. Earth's quick day and night cycles dizziness were causing. The atmosphere, though good, was in some things lacking, in others too abundant. Of the sameness of the food, the heroes were complaining. Enlil, the commander, by the heat of the sun on Earth was afflicted. For coolness and shade, he was longing. While in the Abzu, Enki pre preparations was making. Enlil in his skyship the extent of the Eden was surveying. Of mountains and rivers he took account. Of valleys and plains the measures he took. Where a landing place to establish, a place for the rocket ships he was seeking. Enlil, by the heat of the sun, afflicted, for a place of coolness and shade was searching. To snow-covered mountains on the Eden's north side he took a liking. The tallest trees he ever saw grew there in a cedar forest. There above a mountain valley with power beams the surface he flattened. Hmm. Great stones from the hillside the heroes quarry and to size cut. To uphold the platform with the sky ships they carried and emplace them. With satisfaction did Enlil the handiwork consider, a work beyond belief. Indeed it was, a structure of everlasting. An abode for himself on the crest of the mountain was his desire. Of the tall trees in the cedar forest long beams were prepared. Of them the construction of an abode for himself, he decreed. The abode of the north crest, he named it. On Nibiru, a new celestial chariot for soaring off was prepared. A new kinds of rocket ships, sky ships, and that which Enki had designed it was transporting. A fresh group of 50 from Nibiru is taking. Chosen females among them were. Hey now. By Ninma, exalted lady, were they commanded. In succor and healing were they trained. Ninma, exalted lady, a daughter of Anu she was, a half-sister, not a full sister of Enki and Enlil she was. In succor and healing she was greatly learned. In the treating of ailments she excelled. To the complaints from earth she gave much attention. A healing she was preparing. I'll bet. 
The course of prior chariots on tablets of destiny is recorded. Nungal, its pilot, did follow. Unharmed, it reached the celestial god Lamu. It circled the planet. Slowly, to its surface, it descended. A faint beaming, a group of heroes followed. Ninmo was going with them. Beside a lake shore, Anzu they found. From his helmet, the signals were beaming. Anzu himself was without motion. Prostrate, he lay dead. Ninma touched his face. To his heart, she gave attention. From her pouch, she took out the pulser. Upon Anzu's heart pulsing, she directed. From her pouch, she took out the emitter. Its crystals, life-giving emissions on his body, she directed. Sixty times did Ninma direct the pulser. Sixty times the emitter, she directed. On the sixtieth time, Anzu, his eyes opened. With his lips, he motioned. Gently upon his face, Ninma, water of life, poured. His lips with it wetting. Gently into his mouth, the food of life she placed. Then the miracle did happen. Anzu from the dead arose. About Alalu they him then inquired. Of Alalu's death, Anzu told them. He led them to a great rock, from the plain heavenward protruding. There to them what had happened he was telling. Alalu, soon after the landing from the unremitting pain to scream, began. From his mouth his innards he was spitting. In agony he peered over the wall. Thus was Anzu to them, saying, he led them to a great rock, like a mountain from the plain, heavenward rising. In the great rock a cave I found, all a loose corpse therein I hid. Its entrance with stones I covered, so was Anzu to them, saying. They followed him to the rock, the stones they removed, the cave they entered. Inside what of all a loose remained they found. He who was once on Nibiru a king, was a pile of bones, was in a cave now lying. For the first time in our annals, a king, not on Nibiru, has died. Not on Nibiru was he buried. So did in Masay. Let him in peace for eternity rest, she was saying. Then the cave's entrance again with stones covered. The image of Alalu upon the great rock mountain with beams they carved. I guess that's like lasers, perchance. They showed him wearing an eagle's helmet, his face they made uncovered. Let the image of Alalu forever gaze toward Nibiru that he ruled, toward the earth whose gold he discovered. So Ninma, exalted lady, in the name of her father Anu, did declare, As for you, Anzu, to you, Anu, the king his promise shall be keeping. Twenty heroes with you here shall remain, the way stations building to begin. Rocket ships from earth the golden oars shall here deliver. Celestial chariots from here the gold to Nibiru shall then transport. Hundreds of heroes their abode on Lamu shall make. You, Anzu, <clears throat> shall be their commander. Thus did the great lady in the name of her father Anu to Anzu say, my life I owe you, great lady, so is Anzu saying. My gratitude to Anu shall limits not have. From the planet Lamu, the chariot departed. Toward Earth, the journey, it continued. As we get ready to begin the fifth tablet, some of you may be kind of shocked if you've never read this before. Um, just to see how detailed these stories are. And for me, you know, not to be anti-Christian or in any way bizarre, but the Bible never really had this kind of detail to me. The first time I started reading these translations, I was really struck by just the outright humanity and, you know, the not to be all inner child, shiny, happy or anything, but just the tenderness with which they treat each other. I mean, the king of a planet has his manhood bitten off by, you know, the guy whose ass he kicked. And rather than kill him, he does the unthinkable. 
he basically says, look, you can stay here on a planet with your friend, and, you know, if you're still alive when we show up, you guys can be the rulers of the way station, and, I mean, that's, that's pretty generous, really, when you think about it. So, you may always hear about the Anunnaki being these evil, terrible, you know, alien creatures that created humanity so they could abuse humankind and do all these vile things and it's just really it's not borne out by these translations is all I'm trying to say so anyway um what basically just happened um is Ninma who is related to Enki and Enlil is now on her way to earth to provide extra services because now they basically set up a colony, they're adding more people, they're starting a way station for the gold on Mars, and they're basically planning a chain of way stations from Earth all the way to Nibiru so that gold can always be brought in a steady stream from Earth to Nibiru. It's a fairly clever plan and it's extremely detailed and maybe not what you expected to hear about. So anyway, here we go, the fifth tablet. Um, let's see. I'm reading this from my iPhone, so it's sort of a pain in this. Okay. From the planet Lamu, the chariot departed. Towards Earth, the journey, it continued. Around the moon, they made circuits, a way station thereon to explore. Around the Earth, they made circuits, toward a splashdown slowing. In the waters beside Eridu did Nungal, the chariot, bring down. To a quay, by Enlil constructed, they stepped off. Boats were no longer needed. Enlil and Enki, their sister with embraces, greeted. With Nungal, the pilot, they locked arms. The heroes, male and female, by the present heroes, were with shouts greeted. All that the chariot had brought was quickly unloaded. Rocket ships and sky ships and the tools by Enki designed and provisions of all kinds, of all that on Nibiru transpired, of the death and burying of Alalu, Ninma, her brothers, told. Of the way station on Lamu and the commanding by Anzu, she to them related. Enki of that uttered approval. Enlil words of be bewilderment uttered. That is Anu's decision. His word is unalterable, Ninma to Enlil was saying. For the malady is relief I have brought, Ninma to her brother said. From her pouch a bag of seeds she brought out. Seeds in the soil to be sown, a host of bushes from the seeds shall sprout, a juicy fruit they will produce. The juice and elixir shall form, for drinking by the heroes it shall be good. Their ailments it will chase away, happier their mood it shall make. In a cool place the seeds need to be sown, by warmth and by water they need nourishing. So did Idma to her brother say, the place that is perfect I will show you, Enlil to her said. It is where the landing place was fashioned, where an abode of cedar wood I have made. In Enlil's skyship, the two of them, Enlil and Ninma, skyward soared. To the landing place in the snow-covered mountains by the cedar forest, brother and sister went. On the great stone platform, the skyship landed. To Enlil's abode, they went. Once inside, Enlil embraced her. With a fervor, he kissed Ninma. Oh, my sister, my beloved, Enlil to her whispered. By her loins, he grabbed her. Into her womb, his semen, he did not pour. Of our son, Ninurta, word I bring you, Ninma to him softly said. A young prince he is, for adventure he is ready. To join you on earth he is prepared. If here you stay... Let us, Ninurta, our son, bring over, Enlil to her said. To the landing place heroes were arriving, rocket ships by skyships to the platform they carried. From the pouch of Ninma, the seeds were obtained. In the valley soils, they were sown, a fruit from Nibiru on earth to be grown. In the skyship, Enlil and Ninma to Eridu returned. On the way, Enlil to her the landscape showed. The Eden's extent to her he showed. From the skies Enlil to her his plants explained. An everlasting plan have I designed, to her he was saying. 
That which for all time construction shall determine I have laid out, away from Eridu, where dry land begins, my quarter shall be. Larsa will be its name, a place for directing it shall become. On the banks of the Buranu, the river of deep waters, will it be located. A twin thereof, a city, shall in future arise. Lagash, I shall name it. Between the two, on the plans, a line have I drawn. Sixty leagues thereafter, a healing city shall come into being. A city of our own it shall be. Sherubak, the haven city, I shall name it. On the center line, it shall be located. To the fourth city, it shall be leading. Nibru Key, the earth's crossing place, I will name it. A bond, heaven earth, it I shall name. The tablets of destinies it shall house. All missions it will control. With Eridu, five cities, there shall be counted. To eternity they shall exist. On a crystal tablet, Enlil to Ninma, the master plan was showing. On the tablet she saw more markings. Of them, of Enlil, she inquired. Beyond the five cities, a chariot place I shall henceforth build. From Nibiru to Earth directly to arrive. Stargate, perhaps? Enlil, to her, was responding. Why by Anu's plans for Lamu, Enlil was bewildered. Ninma then understood. My brother, magnificent is your plan for the five cities. To, Nin to him, Ninma was saying. The creation of Sherubap, a city for healing, as my abode for my own to be, is a matter for which grateful I am. Beyond that plan, do not transgress your father. Your brother, too, do not offend. You are wise as well, as beautiful, Enlil said to her. In the Abzu, Enki plans was also conceiving where to build his house, where for heroes' dwellings to prepare, where the bowels of the earth to enter. In his skyship, the extent of the Abzu he measured, its districts he did carefully survey. A distant land the Abzu was, beyond the waters from the Eden it was away. A rich land it was, bursting with riches, perfect in fullness. Mighty rivers rushed across the region. Great waters there rapidly flowed. An abode by the flowing waters Enki for himself established. To the midst of the Abzu, to a place of pure waters, Enki betook himself. In that land, the place of deepness, Enki determined for the heroes into earth's bowels to descend. The earth splitter, Anki there established, therewith in the earth a gash to make, by way of tunnels earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. Nearby, that which crunches and that which crushes, he emplaced, the gold-bearing oars to crunch and crush, by sky ships to be carried, to the landing place in the cedar mountains to be brought, therefrom by sky ships and rocket ships to the way station on Lamu to be transported. On earth more heroes were arriving. Some to the Eden were assigned. Some in the Abzu tasks were given. Larsa and Lagash by Enlil were constructed. Sherubak for Ninma he did establish. With her therein a host of female healers were dwelling, young ones who give succor. In Nibiru Ki, Enlil, a bond, heaven earth, was assembling, from there all missions to command. Between Eridu and the Abzu, Enki was journeying. Back and forth for supervising he went. On Lamu, construction was progressing. Heroes for the way station were also arriving. A shar, two shars, were the preparations lasting. Then Anu gave the word. On earth, the seventh day it was, a day of resting by Enki at the beginning decree. At every place the heroes were assembled. A message from Anu from Nibiru beamed they overheard. In the Eden they were assembled. Enlil was there in command. With him was Ninma. Her host of young ones by her side were assembled. Algar, who was of Eridu, was the master there. Abgal, who was the landing place commanded, also stood. In the Abzu were the heroes assembled. Under the gaze of Anki they stood. 
With Anki was his vizier, Izamud. Nungal the pilot was there too. On Lamu, the heroes were assembled. With their proud commander, Anzu, they stood. Six hundred were on earth. Three hundred on Lamu were gathered. In all, there were nine hundred. The words of Anu, the king, they all heard. Heroes of Nibiru, you are the saviors. The fate of all is in your hands. Your success shall for eternity be recorded. By glorious names you shall be called. Those who on earth are shall as Anunnaki be known. Those who from heaven to earth came. Those who on Lamu are Agigi shall be named. Those who observe and see they shall be called. So that would be the inhabitants of Mars being called the Watchers, sounds like to me. All that is required is ready. Let the gold star coming. Let Nibiru be saved. Okay, so we'll pause it there for now. Um, stay tuned to my channel for more readings, and we will pick up at the uh, fifth tablet.